Okay, so uh, very good uh, evening to Mr. Cairo and my fellow colleagues. Today we shall start our sports CME. Okay, so, uh, our title will be uh, Shoulder Infringement. Okay, so we start off with the definition. So shoulder impingement syndrome is a part of the continuum or a spectrum of a rotator cuff disease. So rotator cuff disease can be divided into five stages, starting with impingement or bursitis, followed by partial tear, followed by full thickness tear, followed by massive tear, followed by rotator cuff arthropathy. So there is uh, basically three types of impingement. First would be the most common with a subacromial impingement, followed by subcoracoid impingement mm. and internal impingement. So we start off with subacromial impingement. So it's a symptomatic impingement of your rotator cuff tendon in the narrow space between acromion and also the humeral head. It's the most common cause of shoulder pain. So start off with a little bit of anatomy. So basically the boundaries of the superior side, you have your acromion, anterior acromion process, followed by your followed by your uh, coracoacromial ligament and also the coracoid process. Inferiorly is your humerus head. So in this picture, you can see your subacromial bursa. So uh, pathophysiology is uh, divided into intrinsic degeneration, extrinsic compression, inflammatory process, and also a surgery condition with uh, shoulder impingement. So intrinsic degeneration basically is uh, regarding the degeneration within the rotator cuff tendon can be partial or full thickness tear, so we should need to increase in the size of the tendon. So also um, causes uh, supraspinatus uh, weakness, which is um, lead to imbalance, inability to balance the humerus head onto the glenoid. So lead to superior migration of your humerus head and then uh, subacromial space narrowing. Extrinsic compression, basically uh, compression of the rotator tendon in between the humeral head and can be the anterior acromion, can be your ACJ uh, with, uh, arthritis, or also a coracoid acromion ligament thickening. So next would be the inflammatory process due to uh, mainly the subacromial bursitis. Then we'll go on to the associated condition related to your uh, uh, impingement syndrome. So basically first would be the hook-shaped acromion uh, associated with high uh, risk of um, impingement. So basically, it's classified into three types, basically flat, curved, and hook. Later, I'll show you the diagram. Next, associated condition is your os acromiali, basically your failure of fusion of your acromion ossification center, which forms the os acromiali. Next will be a scapular dyskinesia. Weak scapular muscles to elevate the scapula can lead to impingement, which will be explained later as well. Posterior castle contracture, malunion and humerus greater uh, tuberosity, and also shoulder instability. So we start with hook shaped acromion. So uh, it's just an anatomy variant. So Bigliani classified them into three, type one, two, and three, flat, curved, and hook. So it's based on the supraspinatus outlet view X-ray. So hook shape at the highest risk for impingement. So this is the picture. You can, you can see this is a flat, which is straight, curved and then a hook shape, so you can see clearer in this diagram. So supraspinatus outlet view, basically uh, positioning will be, the uh, cassette will be on the anterior lateral aspect of the shoulder, and then the beam is directed along the supraspinatus caudally about 10 to 20 degrees. So you get this view. This view was similar to the previous diagram, but it's just on the opposite. So you can see this is a hook. So os acromially, basically your ossification, there's three ossification centers to form the acromion. So mainly your meta acromion, meso acromion, pre acromion. So base, mid, and tip. So failure to fuse will result in the uh, os acromially over here. Next would be the scapular dyskinesia. So mainly by your upper trapezius, lower trapezius, and your serratus anterior. So the last 60 degrees of your adduction of the shoulder is basically by this scapular movement. So if this is restricted, so elevation after 120 will cause impingement because the shoulder are needed to go further. Clinical presentation mainly is pain. So it is uh, insidious, gradual or chronic uh, onset. Then exacerbated by an overhead activity and lifting object when the object is away from the body. 
also will have night pain, which is an indicator for poor success of conservative treatment and also can uh, be worse on when you're lying on the affected side. Next symptom would be weakness. So examination will go to the test. So we call this painful arc test, mm. painful arc sign. So basically, um, there is uh, during passive abduction from 60 to 120 degrees arc, this will cause pain. However, before that, there is no pain and after 120, there is also no pain. So this is basically your painful arc sign. Next is your near. Near impingement sign basically is a passive forward flexion. Uh, more than 90 degrees causes pain. Then near impingement test is considered positive with when after injection of the uh, steroid and also LA to the subacromial space. And then the, from the positive sign, it became negative. So it will be a near impeachment test positive. Next would be your Hawkins Kennedy test, also known as Hawkins. So uh, basically when test in the arm adapted to 90, elbow 90, and then internal rotate will produce pain. If painless, you bring the arm forward 30 degrees and repeat the internal rotation. Next would be your Jobs test, also known as empty can test. So with the both arm in uh, internal rotation, uh, forward flexion, abducted about 90 degrees with a forward flexion of 30 degrees. So you apply downward force while patient resists. So if this causes pain, it indicates uh, impingement also. So you complete your physical examination with a uh, rotator cuff test and also bicep tendon test, ACG test, and also uh, shoulder instability test for young patients. So next we go to imaging. So start with your plane radiograph. You got your Gracie through AT shoulder view, scapula Y view, axillary view, supraspinatus outlet view. So through AP view, basically, um, our as you need to know that the scapula is uh, uh, on the coronal plane is antiverted about uh, 10 to 20 degrees. So to get a true AP view, you need to um, put about 30 to 40 degrees, 45 degrees. Uh, the cassette has to be uh, 45, 45 degrees of the, to the patient and the x-ray should uh, perpendicular to it. So you can see the scapula is actually parallel to the cassette in this view. So how to know whether this uh, is a true AP? When you look at the x-ray, you can see that the glenohumeral joint, there is no uh, overlap of the humerus and also the glenoid. So this is to see any subacromial osteophyte then you can measure your acromial humeral interval, which is usually more than 7 mm. And then also to check if there's any proximal migration of humeral head, so which can lead to rotator cuff atropathy. Next, we do axillary view. So axillary view basically just hand in abducted and then the, the beam directed to the axillary. So this is to identify your os acromiale if present. Next will be your supraspinatus outlet view, which I already explained earlier. Then uh, radiography findings summarize, you just need to see whether it's a proximal migration of humerus head, any present osteophytes, any coracoacromial acromial ligament calcification, whether it's a hook acromion or made the presence of os acromiale. MRI, we see you can look for brusitis or any rotator cuff injury. Management, we start off with non-operative, basically rest, NSAIDs, and then activity modification. modification. Avoid any abduction activities. Then followed by physiotherapy. So periscapular and rotator cuff muscle strengthening exercises, delta strengthening, and posterior capsule stretching exercises. Subacromial steroid with LA injection is also used. Operative-wise, it's indicated when you feel conservative for about four to six months. So the main surgery will be your ASAP, which is arthroscopic subacromial decompression, plus acromioplasty. So basically, it's the debridement of the subacromial pulsa and space. And then acromioplasty is basically the recession of your anterior inferior portion of the acromion. Plus minus rotator cuff repair or ACJ resection. So this is a diagram of how they do the recession. So basically, it's arthroscopic. So you burn the inferior part of the anterior portion of the acromion to cause a, to into a recession to increase the space. So in the end, you get the recession over here, yeah, which increases the subacromial space. Complication can be inadequate decompression, 
deltoid dysfunction if it's done via open acromioplasty and then uh, can have uh, anterior superior escape. So for patient with massive irreparable rotator cuff injury, you should avoid uh, acromioplasty or coracoacromial ligament release to preserve the arch. So subcoracoid impingement is the next impingement we're going to talk about. Before that, uh, any question on the subacromial impingement? All right, we shall proceed with the subcoracoid impingement. So basically, subcoracoid impingement is a symptomatic impingement between the subscapularis in the narrowed space between the coracoid process and the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. <clears throat> so the subcoracoid space is the tip of the coracoid process and the humerus head uh, elicited in this picture. So coracoid is over here, and this is the humerus head, lesser tuberosity, which is, and then this is the subscapularis tendon, which can be impinged. So you can, uh, subscapularis uh, is compressed maximally in flexion of the arm, adduction, adduction, and also internal rotation. <clears throat> so associated conditions that can lead to this pathology would be if the patient got abnormally long coracoid process, anterior shoulder instability, or history of surgery with posterior capsular tightening for internal rotation deficit. So clinical presentation, pain. Uh, pain usually located anterior, worse in, mentioned earlier, flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And on palpation, you have some uh, tenderness over the coracoid process. So examination-wise, uh, we can start off with a global uh, coracoid impingement test. Basically, it's just uh, forward flexion of the arm to 90 degrees, and then adduction to about 10 to 20 degrees. With this adduction, um, the lesser tuberosity is in contact with the coracoid process, causing pain. Then also other examination will be the assessment whether there's a subscapularis muscle weakness. So by your belly press and Gerber lift off. Imaging wise, um, X-ray shows coracohumeral distance is uh, should be about seven mm in normal shoulder. MRI, as previous mentioned, the same as your subacromial impingement. So look for look at the any rotator cuff there <coughs> or bursitis. So management wise, we start off with non-operative, which is rest energetics, activity modification. So avoid flexion, adduction, and internal rotation activities. Physiotherapy is still the same, periscapular and rotator cuff muscle strengthening, delta strengthening, posterior capsule stretching. Subcoracoid steroid and LA injection can be used. Operative wise, when you fail the same, fail four to six months of conservative is indicated. So surgery wise would be an arthroscopic subcoracoid decompression coracoplasty, uh, plus minus, subscapularis repair. So the posterior lateral coracoid recession to recreate the 7mm interval between them. So you have to address anterior shoulder instability if there is if it, if it's present. So basically you shorten the coracoid process. Internal impeachment will be the next topic. The, so internal impeachment basically is a shoulder pathology of pain due to repetitive impingement of the under surface of the rotator cuff at posterior superior aspect of the glenoid in overhead throwing activities. So as an incidence not known, but in uh, overhead activities such as swimming, baseball, pitcher or tennis. So when doing your service. So this is the pathophysiology of it. So impingement occur when your arm is abducted and externally rotated during the late cocking phase and also early acceleration phase of throwing. So this phase are basically. So the under surface impingement. So under the surface of supraspinatus is impinged between the greater tuberosity and the glenoid. So as shown in this picture, the glenoid is over here. This is the humerus, then the supraspinatus is impinged on the under surface. Up here is your sub acromion area, then this is the internal impingement which is under the supraspinatus. So uh, MRI will look for this area to look for any abnormality on this side of the, of the ten tendon. 
So another uh, related issue is uh, the peel back phenomenon by the biceps tendon. So basically, during that same motion, the biceps tendon will pull, leading to uh, peel off over here, causing a slap tear. So you have a peel off uh, of your glenoid labrum on the superior aspect. So there's a like a hole over this side. So which is your slap lesion. So repetitive impingement is basically leads to slap, which is your superior labrum, anterior posterior lesion, or pasta partial articular supraspinatus tendon avulsion, which is shown in uh, left side. This is the slap lesion on the superior side, which is the tear of your labrum on the superior superior labrum tear anterior to posterior, and then due to the bicep tendon, and then the pasta will be impingement on the inferior part of your supraspinatus muscle tendon over here. So this is called a pasta lesion. So internal impingement include fraying of, uh, also include a uh, fraying of posterior rotator cuff, which is at the supraspinatus infraspinatus interval, and then posterior and superior labral lesion, your slap, and then uh, hypertrophy and scarring of posterior glenite capsule, which is your Bennett lesion, and then define it is basically a extra articular posterior ossification due to posterior labral injury and the undersurface of the calf damage. Bony spur at the posterior glenoid rim can be seen. Then cartilage damage at the posterior glenoid. So other associated condition with internal impeachment, basically there is two. So uh, known as GERD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficit, and also six scapula. So six scapula uh, is a acronym for disorganized movement of the joint, which is a scapular malposition, inferior medial prominence, I'll show the picture later, chorapoid pain, and dyskinesia of the scapular movement. So these two conditions can predispose to internal impingement. So in uh, GERD, we start with a uh, condition resulting in the loss of internal rotation of your glenohumeral joint compared to the contralateral side. So if you compare both sides, so if there's loss of internal rotation, means it's most likely it's GRRD. So due to, uh, there is a capsular constraint mechanism because uh, due to tightening of the posterior or posterior inferior capsule, leads to translation of humerus head to the opposite side. And also uh, posterior capsule tightness also lead to, can lead to anterior superior translation during flexion. They think mainly it's all about posterior uh, capsule tightness causing all this uh, translation during your uh, movement. And then um, when the posterior is tight, the anterior is stretched. So as you can see in this picture, so you compare both left and right. So uh, one side can, internal rotation can be full, but the other side is not complete. So there's loss of internal rotation for the right side. So this is a symptom for glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So next we proceed with uh, six scapula mentioned earlier. It's basically an overuse syndrome. Scapula is protracted and anteriorly tilted. There's some coracoid tenderness and then also uh, dysrhythmic scapular motion. So you can see in this picture on the right side, the medial aspect, so scapula mouse position and then the inferior medial border is prominent. Then when you pop it, then you have coracoid pain. And also when you ask, check for movement, it's a dyskinesia of your scapular movement. So clinical presentation, mainly for uh, this will be posterior shoulder pain, gradual onset, tenderness, and also reduced internal rotation. Examination-wise, tenderness over the posterior aspect of the shoulder, uh, reduced internal rotation, 20 degree reduction at 90 degree abduction, and also more than 20 degrees difference, lah, basically. And uh, scapul when and the scapula is stabilized. So special tests include ripple test and apprehension test. So what is ripple test? Ripple test is basically just a forward flexion and a deduction, and then you apply downward force. So if there is pain or is weaker compared to your contralateral side, we suggest you also pass my there. Next would be your apparition test, also known as crank test. In a patient lying down supine, 
shoulder abduction to 90, elbow flex to 90, then passive external rotation. So the hand was initially here, then you passive external rotate it. So it will produce pain. So it's considered positive when there's pain produced during this motion. So it shows that there's an internal impingement or it can be due to anterior shoulder instability. Radiograph wise, you look for panel lesion in your AP or axillary view, which is usually over here, osteophytes or exostosis. MRI wise, you look for the, you assess the labrum and see if there's any rotator cuff there. Look for uh, earlier pasta or slab lesion. And then there's increased signal at the superior labrum for slab and GT. And then MRI in abduction and external rotator position to recreate the internal, internal impingement. So these are the picture of a slab tear. You can see the white part. So there's a discontinuity over it's like it open up. So it's supposed to be one nice white uh, signal here. But because of the slab tear, it's open up. So speed open at least. So this is a slab lesion in a superior part of the glenoid. Then pasta lesion, you look for the lesion over this, this part of your of the supraspinatus. So uh, in the MRI, we'll also show that uh, increased signal in the GT and also superior uh, glenoid signals. Uh, MRI in uh, abduction and external rotation. So management-wise, we start off with non-operative, same lifetime modification, and say stretching exercise, vertical cuff strengthening. Operative, when you feel conservative of six months. So types of operative procedure, which is arthroscopic deprivement of the supraspinatus tendon and labrum, uh, can be uh, supraspinatus tendon repair, and also posterior capsule release. These are three options. So we'll explain in this using this treatment algorithm. So when you feel conservative for your internal impingement, so you check whether how's the supraspinal tendon. If it's less than 50% there, you can debride. But if it's more than 50, you have to attempt to repair your supraspinal tendon. Next, you must see whether there's presence of um, internal rotation deficit. So when there is presence of internal rotation deficit, then you need to add on posterior capsule release for a procedure. But if there is no internal rotation uh, deficit, then no additional pro uh, procedure is required. So that's all for my presentation for today. Any question? Got a question? Any question from from the because I'm starting my surgery lah. Uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay. Any question, uh, Nima? Ada uh, topik lain tak? Topik lain yang satu saja untuk hari ini. Oh, only one. Ah, ya yeah, tu. Uh, okay, okay mingguan. Okay. Nanti send me the the record punya tu. Through, okay. Through apa? Ah, uh, uh, okay. Okay, send your record. Okay, thank you.